This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Star Wars Imperial Assault. Star Wars Imperial Assault was released in 2014 and supports up to five players. Imperial Assault is published by Fantasy Flight Games and designed by Justin Kimpainen, Corey Kanishka, and Jonathan Ying. A typical scenario takes from one to two hours to play. Imperial Assault is a Star Wars themed dungeon crawl game designed off Fantasy Flight's Descent game engine. Game levels are built out with modular tiles and you explore them with some fantastic miniatures. One player assumes the role of the Empire and the other players assume the role of the Rebel Alliance. Each side has various objectives they need to complete to win the game. As you can see, Star Wars Imperial Assault has a lot of content. To keep things simple, this video will focus on the basic rules. We will begin by setting up the tutorial. So, get your bits together people, it's time to set up the game. First, let's set up the environment for the tutorial. Sort through the puzzle piece like map tiles in the box until you find the following tiles. On each map tile is a number that identifies the tile piece. Each terrain piece is double sided designated by an A side and a B side. When you've located the necessary map tiles, assemble the map in the following order. Map tile 25A. Above this, place map tile 33A. To the right, place map tile 27A. Above this, 36A. Below this, bring in map tile 38A. Now on the left, bring in 32A. Below this, bring in a second 38A. Below this, bring in 7B. And finally, bring in map tile 2B. There, we've set up the basic map tiles for our level. Next, we're going to populate our level with the various figures and markers. First, you're going to place two door tokens at the following locations. Next, you're going to place two terminal markers in the following locations. Finally, you're going to place a crate marker in this location. Now we will place each of the figures that will participate in this tutorial. First, place Jen O'Don's figure. Next, place Diala Pasil's figure. After that, you're going to place three stormtroopers at these locations. And finally, you will place one Imperial officer here. Now, if you're playing with more heroes, you will add more Imperial figures. With four heroes in play, you will add a probe droid and an E-Web engineer. I'll leave the different hero and Imperial combinations for you to discover later on your own. To keep things balanced and moving along quickly, our tutorial will use two heroes. Next, locate the following three decks. The deck of Empire Deployment Cards, the Jen O'Don Hero Class Cards deck, and the Diala Pasil Hero Class Card deck. Search through the Empire Deployment Card deck until you find one gray Imperial Officer and one gray Stormtrooper. In the Empire Deployment Card deck, there are gray cards and red cards. Imperial officers and stormtroopers come in both colors, so make sure you select the gray cards. Next, in each of the Hero Class Card decks, 
Find the weapon card. There's only one for each character. Now keep these cards close because we're going to place them in the play area in just a moment. Next in the setup, we're going to establish our play areas. On the upper left hand side of the play area will be the Empire. On the upper right hand side of the play area will be the Heroes or Rebel Alliance. In the lower play area, near the board, we will have our token pool. Place the damage markers, strain markers, condition markers, and dice here. Place the supply card deck in the upper area near the crate marker. In the Empire play area, place the Imperial Officer deployment card and the Stormtrooper deployment card. In the Rebel Hero area, Place the hero cards for Jen O'Don and Diela Pasil. Next to their respective hero cards, place their weapon cards. Also place an activation token with the green side up next to each hero card. And with that, the game is set up and we're ready to learn the rules to play. First, let's take a closer look at the game's characters. We'll begin with the Rebel side and look at heroes and their abilities. The Imperial Assault Core set comes with six Rebel heroes that you can choose to play. Jin Odan, the Smuggler. Gar Khan, the Fierce Warrior. Diala Pasil, the Haunted Exile. Fen Cygnus, the Hardened Veteran. Gideon Argus, the Valiant Commander. And Mac Ashkare, the Bold Renegade. For our tutorial, we're going to use Jen O'Don and Diala Pasil. Next, we're going to walk through each of the stats on the hero card with Jen O'Don. Heroes are represented by 4 by 5 inch hero cards. These hero cards give the player all the necessary stats to play the game. Represented on the board is the corresponding hero figure. In this example, we're going to look at the sly smuggler Jen O'Don and go through her various statistics. It's easy to imagine some of these stats as health bars in a video game. The first stat we're going to look at is Health. Health represents the amount of damage a character can receive before becoming defeated. When a hero takes damage in the game, you put a damage counter on the hero's card. Each damage marker reduces the character's health by one. Many characters have different levels of health, but Jin Odan has a health of 10. As Jen suffers more damage and more damage markers are added to her card, her health is reduced. When Jen suffers 10 damage markers, her health is depleted and she becomes defeated. When a hero becomes defeated, you remove all the damage markers and flip the hero card over to the wounded side. On the wounded side, several of the key statistics on the card have been reduced or changed. You'll notice on the wounded side of Jen's hero card, her health was not impacted. So in this state, she has another 10 points of health that she can use to absorb damage. This is Jen's last chance though, so if she suffers another 10 damage markers, she will be withdrawn from the game. Now let's flip back to the full health side and continue with the stats. Next to the health stat is the endurance stat. Endurance, tracked in points, is the maximum amount of strain that a hero can endure. Heroes have many abilities that have strain costs. For example, Jen O'Don has a quick draw ability that costs two strain to use. 
Similar to damage markers, strain is reflected by strain markers placed on the character card. Each strain marker costs the hero one point of endurance. Jen Odan has an endurance of four and can endure up to four strain markers. Once a hero has depleted his endurance, any additional strain markers result in damage which reduces health. On the flip side, if an effect allows a hero to recover endurance points beyond their current amount, then health points are recovered instead. The next character stat is Speed. A character spends speed points to move their figure on the board. Each time you move a figure in one normal terrain space, it costs you one movement point. However, if you encounter terrain with a blue border, this costs you an additional movement point per space. If a hero needs to move farther than her speed allowance, she can suffer one strain at any point during activation to gain one movement point. The hero may do this up to twice per activation. The next character stat is Defense. Defense is represented by a dice roll. There are two types of defense styles. White dice rolls focus more on agility-based defense. Black dice rolls focus more on impact-related defense. Heroes with a white defense tend to evade or dodge attacks. Heroes with a black defense tend to block attacks. We'll cover off more in defense in the combat section. Below the main stats, you'll notice that there are three boxes with icons and colored symbols. These boxes represent the hero's attributes to complete certain tests in the campaign. The first box is for tests of strength. Strength tests are often used to overcome physical obstacles or resist a physical threat. The second box is for tests of insight. Insight tests are often related to the use of the force or general perception and awareness. And the third box is for tech tests. Tech tests are often related to slicing terminals and repairing objects. The colored cubes next to the icon represent the dice that need to be rolled to try to pass the test. If you roll a surge on these dice, then you pass the test. Next, let's take a look at the various colored dice and see how they work. Now, let's talk about the symbols and relationships between the different types of dice. First, we'll begin with the green dice, which is the balanced dice. This particular side of the green dice represents all the main symbols. The burst symbol is for damage. We've seen earlier how damage affects health. The charge symbol is for surge. Rolled surge symbols can be used to trigger special abilities or complete challenges. And any numbers represent accuracy. Specifically, this number represents the number of spaces that you can target enemies. The green dice has a balanced distribution of these symbols. The remaining colored dice emphasize a focus in each one of these areas. The red dice has an emphasis on damage. You'll notice that while the red dice has more damage symbols, it does not have any range numbers. And it only has a single surge symbol on one dice face. The yellow dice has an emphasis on surges. 
There are surges on four sides of the dice, and one side has a double surge. However, this comes at a cost. The range is much shorter, and there's less opportunities to do damage. And the blue dice has an emphasis on accuracy. You'll notice on the blue dice that accuracy starts with a 2 and goes all the way up to 5. There's less emphasis on damage, but far less on surges. Now we've covered off on the colored attack dice. Let's now look at the black and white defense dice. As we saw earlier, black defense dice have a focus on blocking. White defense dice have a focus there on evasion. There are a total of three defense results that can be rolled. Rolling a block result cancels one damage result from an attack dice. Multiple blocks on a roll mean that multiple attacks get canceled. Some faces on the white dice allow a block and an evade result. Rolling an evade result cancels one surge result. Finally, exclusive to the white dice is the dodge result. The dodge result causes an attack to miss. Keep these dice results in mind when you're formulating attacks and defenses. Now that you're familiar with the hero cards, you can compare the statistics between Jen O'Don and Diala Pasil. As you can see, Diala has more health and endurance, but Jen has more speed. Diala does not excel at tech tests, but Jen does. Diala's insight has an additional yellow dice to roll. And Diala excels at strength tests. Keep these abilities in mind as we play through the tutorial and you play through your own games. Next, let's talk about the hero's weapons. Each hero also has their own deck of class cards. Each hero's class card deck contains their signature weapon as well as other special abilities that can be purchased with experience. For the tutorial, we will only focus on the weapons in the class card deck. In formal campaigns, experience points can be used to purchase these additional class cards. The experience cost for each of these class cards can be found in the lower left hand corner. For now, let's focus on the weapon card that we will use in the tutorial. Weapons are divided into two classes. Ranged weapons, like Jen O'Don's Vintage Blaster, and melee weapons, like Diala Pasil's Plasteel Staff. Now let's look at each of these weapons in greater detail. This is Jen O'Don's Vintage Blaster. The Vintage Blaster allows Jen to attack with two green dice. If Jen rolls a surge, she can translate that into either an additional damage or plus one to her accuracy. Since this is a ranged weapon, you must also roll the appropriate amount of range to hit your target. Now, let's take a closer look at Diala's Plasteel Staff. Diala's Staff is a melee weapon so that means you need to be adjacent to your target to attack. The staff attacks with a green dice and a yellow dice. If Diala's player rolls a surge, then her target is stunned. This places a special damage condition card on her target. A surge can also be transferred into one additional damage. Now, let's look at those special damage conditions a little more closely. There are three conditions that can affect a character. One beneficial condition, called focused, and two harmful conditions, stunned and bleeding. With a focus condition, when a player declares an attack or attribute test, they may add one green dice to the dice pool. 
After they've resolved their attack or attribute test, they must discard the card. With the stun condition, like we saw with Diala's staff, you cannot attack or voluntarily exit your space. That character must use an action to discard this condition. With a bleeding condition, a character must suffer one damage point when they conduct another action. They must spend one of their actions to discard this condition. When a hero gains a condition, place the condition card next to their hero card. When any other figure gains a condition, place a condition marker near the figure. A final note, a figure cannot be affected by multiple instances of the same condition. For example, if a figure that is already stunned would become stunned again for any reason, nothing happens. Now that we've covered the heroes, let's turn our attention to the Imperial players' forces. While Rebel players focus on one hero character, the Imperial player has a multitude of characters to control. This is why if you have a group of new players, the most experienced player should play the Imperial side. With deployment cards, one card can represent several figures in the game. The symbol along the edge of the card tells the player how many figures they have for that deployment group. In this example, a single gray Stormtrooper card grants the player three Stormtrooper figures. The gray Imperial Officer card only allows one figure. As you may have noticed from looking through the deck, Imperial Deployment cards come in two colors, gray and red. The difference between the two is that the red cards represent much more experienced troops. Therefore, their stats and abilities will be greater than their gray counterparts. Now, let's take a look at each of these deployment cards in greater detail. First, let's look at our Gray Stormtrooper deployment card. Let me draw your attention to the stats at the top of the card. In the upper left-hand corner of the card, there is a number. This is the deployment cost. Next to that number may be a second smaller number. This is the reinforcement cost. These stats are used when playing a formal campaign. Below these stats, you'll remember that we have the group limit icon, which shows the number of figures that the card supports. A quick note, if you have multiple figures and cards of the same type, you can use numbers to distinguish between them. The game comes with colored number stickers and tokens that you can use for these larger campaign games. Several of the stats at the bottom of the card mirror their counterparts on the hero cards. The first stat is health. One Stormtrooper figure has a health of three. With Imperial figures, quantity outweighs quality in most cases. While the average hero has around 10 health, there are three Stormtrooper figures to contend with. The next stat is speed. Following that is defense. Obviously, stormtroopers use the black dice for defense since they block attacks. I guess that's one way of putting it. And after that, the attack ability. Stormtroopers actually have pretty good range. Now let's look at their special abilities. If a stormtrooper rolls a surge, they can add an additional damage marker or plus two to their accuracy. They also benefit from squad training. This means if they're adjacent to another stormtrooper, they may reroll one attack dice. Now let's take a look at our Imperial Officer. As you can see, this card only supports one figure. A gray Imperial Officer has a health of three. They have a speed of four. They defend with a white dice, so more often than not they're trying to evade attacks, and they attack with a blue dice and a yellow dice. For their special abilities, when they roll a surge, they can enter a focus condition, or they can do plus one damage. 
or add two to their accuracy. They can use one of their actions to place an order. This allows them to choose another friendly figure within two spaces. That figure may interrupt to perform a move. They may also, um, cower. So while defending, while they're adjacent to another friendly figure, they may re-roll one defense dice. The rules we covered off on in the hero section are also applicable here. And that gives you an idea of the layout of the deployment cards and what all the different statistics mean. So now both sides should know how to manage their characters. Now, let's get back to our tutorial level and we'll walk through the various game phases for each player. This is our tutorial level that we set up a little while ago, and here is the scenario. Two of our rebel heroes are inside a rebel outpost, guarding two terminals. An imperial force has just arrived, and they're going to attempt to invade the outpost and take command of the two terminals. To win the game, the heroes must stop the imperial forces. For the empire to win the game, they must access the two terminals. The game begins with the rebel player, who will activate their character, take two actions, and then transition to the Imperial player. The Imperial player will then activate one of his deployment cards and take two actions for each of the figures on that card. Then the game will revert back to the next hero character who will take their two actions, and then back to the Imperial player who will select a new deployment card and take two actions for each figure on that card. So now that we know the turn sequence, let's start with Jen O'Don, and we will learn the actions that she can take. This is the order I've chosen for the tutorial. When playing your own game, you can decide which heroes will go first, second, and so forth. Likewise, the Imperial player can decide which deployment cards he wants to use first, second, and so forth. In Imperial Assault, there are five actions. A figure may select two of these actions per turn. Move, Attack, Interact, Rest, or Special. Now, let's go through each of these in greater detail so we can understand the advantages of each. First, let's discuss Move. When you select the move action, you can use your speed points to move your figure across the board. In Imperial Assault, there are five terrain types. Normal terrain costs one speed point per space. Spaces with a blue border are considered difficult terrain and cost one additional speed point to move into. Walls, which typically border the levels, cannot be passed through. Spaces with a broken red border cannot be moved into, but you can shoot through them. Spaces with a solid red border are considered blocked. They cannot be moved through, and you cannot shoot through them. With Jen's five speed points, she can move five normal spaces. Next, let's look at the attack action. When you select attack as your action, you use the hero's weapons card. The weapons card will list the attack dice you need to use. If you're playing the imperial side, the attack is listed on the deployment card in the lower right hand corner. I will cover attacks and the associated combat mechanics a little bit later in the tutorial. The next action you can select is to interact with an object. Typical objects you can interact with in a level are doors, crates, and terminals. A figure may interact with an object if they're adjacent to that object or they are in the same space as the object. Just a quick note, in some campaigns, interacting with objects may require you to pass a test. These tests will require you to roll a surge to be successful. In the tutorial, any interaction with objects is immediately successful. Some tests will require multiple surges to be successful. Imperial Assault also uses what I call the pickle jar rule. 
If you've ever had a pickle jar that won't open and you've passed it around amongst your friends while each person tries to open it, you'll know what I mean. If a player fails to roll the required amount of surges, then you place a strain marker next to the object. This strain token will give the next player a plus one surge when they attempt to interact with it. Hence, the pickle jar lid has been loosened a little bit. Another action that may be taken is to rest. If a hero chooses to rest, they will remove strain tokens equal to their endurance. Once the strain markers are removed, the hero will regain health equal to the remaining points. A hero cannot regain health beyond his or her normal capacity. Finally, you may select Special as an action. A good example is on the Imperial Officer Deployment card. Any ability prefixed with the action symbol is considered a special action. For example, this Imperial Officer can select Order as their special action. The Imperial Officer may choose another friendly figure within two spaces. That figure may interrupt to perform a move. There are several different actions printed on the cards throughout the game that you can use as your special. Now that we've discussed all the different actions, let's begin playing with Jin Odan as the first Rebel player. We're going to select Move as Jin's first action and see how this works in the tutorial. This will give Jin's player 5 speed points to move her figure. Now let's return to the game board and see how this plays out. Now we switch back to our tutorial and I've enhanced all the lines on the board so we can see the spaces. When moving from one space to the next, I can move up, down, left, right, as well as moving diagonal. Moving into a square from one of these directions costs me one speed point. Another interesting note about speed points is once I've selected move as one of my actions, I can use those speed points throughout my activation. Therefore, I could move and then shoot, or move and then interact with an object, and then move again. For Jin's movement action, I'm going to move her five spaces back to the crate. Now Jin is adjacent to the crate, and for my next action, I think we're going to interact with it. So for Jin's second action, she's going to choose to interact. To interact with an object, the figure either needs to be adjacent to that object or in the same space as the object. When a figure interacts with a crate, then you draw a supply card from the supply card deck. Once you've drawn your supply card, you remove the crate from the level. Jin's player draws a card from the deck and learns that they have acquired a shock grenade. With the shock grenade, a player can choose to use one of their actions to select a space and then within three spaces of that space, roll one yellow dice. Each figure on or adjacent to that space suffers damage equal to the damage results and becomes stunned. Then discard this card. So, this may come in useful later, but for now, Jen has used both of her actions and her turn is over. So let's clean up the board just a little bit before moving on. We remove the crate that we got the shock grenade from and we place the shock grenade card next to our vintage blaster card. Since we've completed our activation, we flipped our activation token over to the red side. Now we're ready for the imperial side to play. With the imperial side, we have three figures that we need to take two actions with each. So we've got our work cut out for us. Let's get started. The first figure is going to take a move action. Our stormtrooper has a speed of 4, which means they can move 4 normal spaces. So we're going to move our stormtrooper 4 spaces diagonally towards the left door. 
Now we don't have enough speed to make it to the door, so we're going to stop here. There are also no other actions we need to take at this time, so we're going to end this stormtrooper's turn here. Our next stormtrooper is also going to move as its first action. Our second stormtrooper is going to use three of his speed points to make three diagonal moves to the right door. Then for that stormtrooper's second action, they're going to interact with the door. When any character interacts with the door, the door is removed from the level. Our stormtrooper has one movement point left, so he's going to move over one space to the right to make room for the third stormtrooper. And now the second stormtrooper's turn is complete. Our third stormtrooper is also going to take a move as the first action. So our third stormtrooper is going to use his speed points to move to the door next to the second stormtrooper. Now with the door removed, the third stormtrooper has line of sight to Diala. For the third stormtrooper's second action, he's going to attack. For ranged attacks, first a figure must establish a clear line of sight. To establish a clear line of sight, the player must be able to draw two lines from the attacking figure to the corners of the space of the target. These two lines cannot be obstructed by any terrain such as walls or barriers. Now that we've established a clear line of sight, we must calculate the required accuracy. Accuracy is calculated by counting the number of spaces between the attacker and the target. In this example, the required accuracy is 4. The stormtrooper is attacking with a blue dice and a green dice. Diala is defending with a white dice. So both sides roll simultaneously. First, the attacker must check to see if they've achieved accuracy. Add up the numbers on the dice, which in this case is 6. 6 is greater than the required accuracy of 4, so this is a hit. If the attacker was not able to meet the required accuracy, then the whole attack fails. Next, we're going to add up the surges and damage icons on the dice. The attacker rolled one surge, and three damages. Now let's turn our attention to the defender's white dice results. Diala rolled one evade and one block. Therefore, the evade nullifies the surge and the block nullifies one damage. Unfortunately, two damages make it through Diala's defense. So as a result of this attack, Diala receives two damage markers on her hero card and loses two health points. And with that, the Imperial side's turn is complete. For proper game etiquette, when the Imperial side finishes with a deployment card, they turn the card onto its side. Much like the red exhausted activation token, turning a card on its side communicates that you've exhausted that deployment card. Exhausted deployment cards and heroes cannot be used again during this game round. Next, it's the Rebel Player 2's activation, in this case, Diala's turn. Diala is going to use her first action to move. Diala has a speed of 4, so she receives 4 speed points to use for her movement. So let's head back to the board and see what happens. Diala is going to use 2 of her speed points to move 2 spaces towards the stormtroopers. Now you might be thinking, Diala is using a melee weapon, that's not close enough. But that's not entirely true. Diala's Plasteel Staff has a Reach ability. 
So let's pause for just a moment and look at these keywords to understand what they mean. In Star Wars Imperial Assault, there are a number of ability keywords to know and understand. These keywords can appear on any of the cards in the game. The first keyword is Blast. For our example, refer to the Fen's Cygnus Hero card. One of Fen's abilities is the Havoc Shot. If Fen uses one strain point while attacking with a ranged weapon, then this attack also gains a blast of one. So this is how blast works. If Finn is successful in causing damage, then that attack also affects the adjacent figures and objects. Since the Havoc Shot gives you a blast of one damage, those adjacent figures and objects would receive one damage each. The next keyword is Cleave. For our example, we're going to look at Garkhan's Vibro Axe, which has a Cleave ability. If Garkhan rolls a Surge during an attack, he may use that Surge to activate his Cleave ability. This is how the Cleave ability works. If Garkhan successfully damages attack on one figure, this will allow him to attack a second hostile figure or object. The next keyword is Pierce. To see an example for Pierce, look at Mach Ashkare's Long Blaster. If Mach rolls a Surge, he may use that Surge to activate his Pierce ability. The Pierce ability essentially allows him to ignore a number of block results equal to the Pierce value. The next keyword is Recover. For an example of Recover, look back to Finn Cygnus' Hero card. His second ability is Lone Wolf, which has a Recover ability. Specifically for the Lone Wolf ability, if at the end of Finn's activation there are no friendly figures adjacent to you, Recover one Strain. Recover will allow you to remove damage or strain tokens equal to the Recover value. The final keyword is Reach. For an example of Reach, look to Diala's Plasteel's Staff. With Reach, melee weapons have a range of two spaces rather than just the adjacent space. Now back to the game, and you can see that Diala can save speed points because of her Plasteel Staff's Reach ability. Diala has two speed points remaining and she can use those at any time during her activation. And now that she's within reach of her target, she can use her second action to attack. So now let's move to our combat screen. Since this is a melee attack, we do not need to establish line of sight. Diala is attacking with her Plasteel Staff and gets a yellow attack dice and a green attack dice. The Stormtrooper is defending with a black defense dice. So both sides roll their dice simultaneously. Since there is no accuracy requirement, we do not need to pay attention to the numbers on the dice. So let's add up our surge and damage symbols. Diala rolled two surges and three damages. The Stormtrooper rolled one block. The block symbol nullifies one of Diala's damage symbols. So two of Diala's surge symbols and two damage symbols go through the Stormtrooper's defenses. The Stormtrooper has a health of three, so this nearly kills him. However, Diala still has two surges that she can spin to modify her attack. If the target were stronger, she could use one surge to stun and the second surge for an additional damage. However, she only needs one more damage to take out the Stormtrooper, so she's just going to use one surge to create an additional damage symbol. With three damage, the Stormtrooper is eliminated and removed from the game. 
So back at the board, we remove the Stormtrooper figure. And Diala still has two speed points to spend for her movement action. Diala will use them to move diagonally out of range from the other Imperials. And with that, Diala's turn is complete. So we flip over Diala's activation token to its red exhausted side. And now it's the Imperial player's turn. Now the Imperial side only has an Imperial Officer Deployment card left to activate. Now for the Imperial side's first action, they are going to move. So let's head back to the board and see how this plays out. The Imperial Officer is going to move four spaces into the outpost. For his second action, he's going to attack Diala. First, we check line of sight between the Imperial Officer and Diala. Line of sight is clear, and now we check to see what our required accuracy is. We count the spaces between the Imperial Officer and Diala and discover that the required accuracy is 3. The Imperial Officer is attacking with a blue dice and a yellow dice. Diala is defending with a white dice. So both sides simultaneously roll their dice. The Imperial Officer rolls an accuracy of 3 and just meets the minimum requirements. Unfortunately for the Imperial Officer, and fortunately for our hero, Diala rolled a dodge. When a dodge is rolled, no matter what the accuracy, the attack misses. However, if the Imperial Officer rolled Surges, he could still use those Surges for abilities not related to this attack. A prime example would be still using Surges to recover. Any Surges that would require accuracy would not work. Now as you can see, rolling a dodge can be pretty powerful. And with that, our Imperial Officer's second action is complete and his turn is over. Now that we've completed the Imperial Officer's turn, we turn his card onto its side to signify it's exhausted. Now that all figures and heroes have been exhausted, you start the whole phase over again. Gameplay continues until either the Imperials are defeated by the Rebels, or the Imperials interact with each terminal, at which point they win. This concludes the basic rules tutorial for Star Wars Imperial Assault by Fantasy Flight Games. In the next episode, we will look at Imperial Assault's advanced rules for campaigns and skirmishes. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. I thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.